Okay, welcome back. We're going to talk about the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse for the remainder of the lectures for this module. The Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse marks the second major battle during the Overland Campaign, and it was fought from May the 8th to May the 21st, 1864. Grant decided that he wanted to try to bait Lee um, into fighting in more open ground by getting between Lee's army and Richmond, which was sure to end the war, according to Grant. Lee surmised this because he stated, quote, it's what I would do. And so a race occurs between uh, the Union and the Confederacy to get from the Battle of the Wilderness to Spotsylvania Courthouse. Whichever side can get there first can entrench, can take up a blocking position, and hopefully prevent uh, the Confederacy, hopefully prevent Grant getting through to Richmond. Because uh, Spotsylvania Courthouse, the, uh, the Brock Road, was a major thoroughfare that led straight to Richmond. The Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse was the second major campaign. Following a costly but inconclusive Battle of the Wilderness, Grant moved his army to the southeast, attempting to lure Lee into battle. Figuring that was what Grant would do, elements of Lee, Lee's army beat U the Union Army to the critical crossroads of Spotsylvania Courthouse and began to dig in. Lee managed to <clears throat> beat Grant, block the road, and fighting began on May the 8th when, when uh, General Warren's 5th Corps engaged General Anderson's Confederate 1st Corps at a place called Laurel Hill near the road to Spotsylvania Courthouse. Remember, Anderson was temporarily in command of the 1st Corps because General Longstreet had been shot in the neck and was wounded during the Battle of the Wilderness. So fighting occurred on and off from about May the 8th to the 21st as Grant tried various schemes to break through the Confederate line. In the end, uh, the battle was tactically inconclusive, but with almost 32,000 casualties on both sides, it was the costliest battle of the campaign. Union leadership for Spotsylvania was pretty much the same as it had been for the Battle of the Wilderness. <clears throat> the same Union Corps commanders began the, uh, the battle that fought in the wilderness, but General Sedgwick would die from a sniper's bullet on, on May the 9th when he, when he haughtily stood up during enemy fire while his men were hunkered down taking cover. He boastfully proclaimed to one of his soldiers, quote, why, my man, I am ashamed of you dodging that way. Why, they couldn't hit an elephant at this dist... And he never finished the statement. He never completed the sentence because a sniper's bullet struck him in the head. Blood streamed from a hole beneath Sedgwick's left eye, and he collapsed, fell down dead. Sedgwick was the highest-ranking Union officer killed during the Civil War. <clears throat> Taking his place on the left, General Horatio Wright assumed command of the U.S. 6th Corps. Emory Upton, in the middle, was commander of the 121st New York Regiment. We'll talk about him more in a minute. And General Ambrose Burnside commanded the U.S. 9th Corps. If you take a look at the photograph of Burnside, you'll see that he is striking the classic uh, Napoleon pose that so many generals did during the Civil War. And this is just one more indication how much of an influence Napoleon had on the Civil War. We get the word sideburns, by the way, uh, from this man, Ambrose Burnside, because of his unique uh, facial hair. On the Confederate side, <clears throat> Lee still retained overall command of the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, General Richard Anderson took over the First Corps because of Longstreet's uh, being wounded. General Richard S. Yule commanded the Second Corps, as he had before at the Battle of the Wilderness. And Jubal Early, who remained an unrepentant rebel long after the war ended, took over A.P. Hill's Third Corps while Hill was, re was recovering from an illness. Lee used his cavalry extensively during this battle with the famous Je uh, Jeb Stuart and Fitzhugh Lee, who, by the way, was the nephew of Robert E. Lee. Grant's initial moves included marching his four corps southeast towards Spotsylvania to try to get around Lee's right flank. Now, you'll recall that the primary role of Civil War cavalry <clears throat> is to be the eyes and the ears of the commander. And so Lee sent his best horsemen to see what Grant was up to, Jeb Stuart. And Stuart reported back to Lee that Grant was on the move. 
So Lee sent his army to head off the Union Army at Spotsylvania Courthouse. And so throughout the night of May the 7th, Stewart's cavalry harassed Union infantry as much as they could and then took up a blocking position on Brock Road near the courthouse. After skirmishing with, with General Sheridan's Union cavalry, Warren's V Corps arrived to form a battle line which caused Stewart to leave and seek help. <clears throat> Alarmed at the arrival of the U.S. V Corps, Stewart sent a dispatch to General Anderson's First Corps, who were stationed nearby camping, having breakfast. By 0800, that's 8 o'clock in the morning, Anderson's First Corps arrived and drove off Sheridan and Warren with little difficulty. Wanting to take the high ground, Anderson moved up to a position called on Laurel Hill, about two miles northwest of Spotsylvania Courthouse. And so that afternoon, <clears throat> the Union 5th and 6th Corps advanced on Laurel Hill, and before the following day, both sides had, had dug entrenchments and extended their battle lines. This battle map shows the positions each side occupied during the battery, battle, so let's talk about that. Names that are in all capital letters, of course, uh, represent Corps commanders. And so as you look at the map, uh, starting from the left in blue, we have Hancock, Warren, Wright, and Burnside. And in the red, starting from left to right, we have Anderson, Ewell, and Early. So we've got four Union Corps against three um, Confederate Corps. Union, the Union Army had about 100,000 men, while the Confederacy had about 50,000 for this particular battle. And also, one other thing, uh, names are, are, when studying a battle map, uh, an army's right, you'll often hear that, or you'll read about uh, right flank, left flank, center. And so when studying a battle map, an army's right, center, and left are so named as if you were in that army facing the enemy. And so starting with the Union, um, we see Hancock's Second Corps anchoring the Union right, Warren's Fifth Corps, and Horatio Wright's Sixth Corps occupying the Union center, and then Burnside's Ninth Corps on, on Grant's right flank. And in the red, Anderson's 1st Corps held the Confederate left, General Ewell's 2nd Corps had the center, and Jubal Early's 3rd Corps, who was temporarily filling in for A.P. Hill, held the Confederate right in front of Spotsylvania Courthouse. If you notice in the center, the Confederate center, you'll see that Ewell's position formed what's called a salient, uh, also known as a bulge. Uh, it's a battlefield feature that projects into enemy territory. The salient is surrounded by the enemy on multiple sides, making the troops inside the salient vulnerable. And this, this salient formed because Grant had ordered Burnside's Ninth Corps to advance on Lee's right, Early's position, uh, at Spotsylvania Courthouse, which caused Lee to sort of bend back his line, forming this bulge, this salient. And because of its shape, <clears throat> the salient was nicknamed by the soldiers who fought there, the Mule Shoe, the Mule Shoe. Because of their vulnerability, Confederates inside the mule shoe hauled up 22 extra cannons and then began to <clears throat> take uh, tree limbs, which they whittled the, the points to like spears called abatis, and they laid those out and formed really like a hedge of protection uh, against any kind of a, a, a cavalry charge or even an infantry charge. The mule shoe was about three quarters of a mile um, deep and with about a half mile wide base. And one particular part of the mule shoe, the northwest side, would become famous for this battle, uh, and it was called the Bloody Angle because of the brutal fighting that occurred there. With both sides deployed, it was during this time that General Sedgwick was killed by a uh, Confederate sniper firing a Whitworth rifle, which was a British import sniper rifle. Sedgwick, as I mentioned earlier, became the highest ranking Union officer killed during the war. And of course, this event that happened to Sedgwick pre prefigures the, the conditions that are going to happen 50 years later during the Great War, when men in trenches could not lift their heads above the parapet for fear of being struck by a sniper's bullet. Grant took the opportunity to dispatch his trusty cavalry commander, General Phil Sheridan, to ride around Lee's army to Richmond. Once he found out about it, Jeb Stewart, <clears throat> Lee's cavalry commander, gave chase, and the two opposing cavalry forces ended up meeting one another in a battle 
at a place called Yellow Tavern, which was an abandoned hotel about six miles north of Richmond. And during the battle, Union forces outgunned their rebel counterparts with the new Spencer repeating rifle. During the battle, Stuart was shot by a 44 caliber revolver and died on May the 12th. Thinking Spotsylvania to be within his grasp, Warren's 5th Corps attacked up Laurel Hill <clears throat> on May the 10th, where they were surprised to find Anderson's 1st Corps opposing them. Warren tried to drive the Confederates off the hill, but was rebuffed with, se with severe losses. And so the two sides did what they did during the Battle of the Wilderness. They, they, uh, they started to dig in and trench. Grant spent May the 10th probing Lee's line for a weak spot. <clears throat> And it was General Wright, who was in, now in command of the 6th Corps, who thought he had found a weak spot along the left leg of the mule shoe. So, General Wright ordered Colonel Emery Upton of the 121st New York to come up with a strategy to break the mule shoe. And interestingly, uh, Colonel Upton had tried a unique tactic at Rappahannock Station a, a, the year before, which proved successful. And so he decided to try it again. Upton gathered 12 regiments of Union men, about about 5,000 soldiers from different units, and formed them into four columns of infantry. You'll recall that the standard um, tactical formation in the Civil War was not column, but rather lines or linear formation. And so this was fairly revolutionary, what Upton was doing here. He then instructed uh, only those in the front of the column to load their muskets. Nobody was permitted to yell or, or stop once the charge began. So, following a 20-minute artillery barrage, a soldier waved a white handkerchief, uh, the signal for Upton's men to charge. And upon that signal, these men clambered from the tree line, ran 200 yards, crashing into the mule shoe like a human battering ram. Upton's charge nearly worked, but for the fact that Gershom Mott's 4th Division failed to provide Upton the needed support that he wanted. And although Upton's men captured 300 rebel prisoners, Confederate reinforcements arrived and drove the Federals back. And so though Upton's assault was indecisive, it gave Grant an idea as he was heard to remark, quote, a brigade today will try a corps tomorrow. And so this battle map <clears throat> shows Upton's charge uh, on the Confederate lines at the Mule Shoe. You can see on the map that Upton's charge occurred on the left side of the salient. The dark blue arrows represent his initial charge, and the light blue arrows show his retreat when, when Gershom Mott failed to support him. Although Upton's charge may not have been as tactically uh, successful as he would have liked, it did result in his receiving a battlefield promotion for taking out several Confederate cannons inside the mule shoe. After Upton's men breached the Confederate lines, his 121st New York and 96th Pennsylvania were able to silence nearby Confederate batteries. And this was critical because had the rebels been able to turn their cannons on Upton's troops, the effect of, of point-blank artillery fire would have been catastrophic, and it would have disintegrated Upton's men inside the salient. Upton's capture of the batteries would echo 80 years later as First Lieutenant Dick Winters of the 101st Airborne led a column formation of Easy Company troopers to capture Nazi guns uh, at, at the famous Brecourt Manor in France. After the war, General Upton would go on to author his own series of infantry attack manuals, which were adapted into the U.S. Army in 1867. The following day, May the 11th, <clears throat> heavy rains uh, uh, provided a much-needed rest from the fighting. Grant used the opportunity to amass some 18,000 men from Hancock's 2nd Corps to charge the mule shoe, just like Colonel Upton had done the previous day. And as Lee observed much movement among the Union lines, as Grant was, was rotating men around for this charge, Lee thought, mistakenly, that Grant was attempting a flanking attack, and therefore Lee ordered all rebel artillery to be taken out of the mule shoe and moved to the roads. Huge mistake. And this turned out to be Lee's worst error in judgment during the war. At around 0430 or 430 in the morning, Hancock's entire second corps stormed out of the woods half a mile from the, from the mule shoe. In just 10 minutes, the Confederate line was overrun and 2,800 Confederate soldiers were taken prisoner along with 20 cannons. Luckily for the Confederates, General Gordon's 
Georgia, Georgia Brigade, along with two other brigades, counterattacked. And so for about 18 hours, the fighting inside the mule shoe was nothing was like nothing yet seen in the Civil War. Uh, men bashed each other's skulls in with their muskets. They, they stabbed their comrades with uh, their enemy with bayonets and fired point blank into one another with mini balls. So you can imagine the, the slaughter, the, the devastation that that wrought. And during the fighting in the mule shoe, Lee constructed a new line of entrenchments across the base of the salient. Exhausted from the attack on May the 12th, Grant moved his forces to his left and tried again to breach through Lee's lines, but they were easily repulsed. Grant called the attack off, and on the night of May the 20th, Grant moved his army once again, swinging it to the southeast, hoping to turn Lee and force the Army of Northern, Northern Virginia into uh, a stand-up fight in more open country. And so, similar to the race to Spotsylvania, Lee departed the charred landscape of the Mule Shoe and on May the 22nd entrenched, dug in a strong position behind the North Anna River, once again blocking Grant's path to Richmond, which, by the way, Grant was now uh, 25 miles closer to Richmond. Lee learned a, a great deal about his opponent during the course of the Wilderness and Spotsylvania, which was that Grant intended to grind his opponent down in a bloody war of attrition. A quote from Grant during this battle sort of epitomizes that mindset when he replied to the War Department on May the 8th of his status. And so I'm going to quote from a letter that uh, Grant wrote. It was written at 8 a.m., May the 11th, 1864. Quote, Honorable Edwin M. Stanton, Secretary of War, Washington, D.C. We have now entered the sixth day of very hard fighting. The result <clears throat> to this time is much in our favor. Our losses have been heavy as well as those of the enemy. I think the loss of the enemy must be greater. We have taken over 5,000 prisoners in battle, while he has taken from us but few except stragglers. I propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. Signed, U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General, Commanding Armies. The Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse resulted in 18,400 Union casualties, 12,960 Confederate casualties. Tactically, the battle was a draw, as had been the Battle of the Wilderness. But strategically, the battle further eroded the morale of Confederate troops as they realized that, that this Grant was a man who would not stop, and Lee never again advanced on Union positions from that time forth. From this point, Lee was fighting a purely defensive war. After Spotsylvania, Grant tried a few more times to engage Lee, but found himself hindered by Lee's strong defensive earthwork positions. So Grant moved again around Lee's flank in the direction of Richmond. Major engagements, engagements occurred at uh, North Anna River, the, and that's where we get the Battle of North Anna, as well as the Battle of Cold Harbor, uh, after which Grant crossed the James River to attack Petersburg. The armies then faced each other for nine months in the siege of Petersburg before the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse in 1865. Of course, while Grant battled Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, his master plan unfolded with five separate offenses all launched at the same time. As Sherman was wreaking havoc in the Western Theater, General Fran Siegel was marching through the Shenandoah, General Nathaniel Banks was traveling up Louisiana's Red River to neutralize the rebels in the Southwest, and General Benjamin Butler was moving up the James River to hit Richmond from the southeast. And this was the plan that was going to end the war. We're going to stop there, and uh, we will pick it up next time, next week. Uh, and so I wish you a good day.